Thank you very much for joining me, Tony. You're very welcome. Now, I just need to change the slides because we are going to make you reverse a red-black trick. No. no. We're not going to make you do interview questions. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so what's your name? Where do you work? And what do you do? Hey, everybody. I'm Tony. I work at Itty Bitty Apps. I'm lead developer on Reveal. Um, mainly, I do Mac OS development, but my role at Itty Bitty involves product development, um, sales and support, and at the moment, I'm doing web development as well. So a um, little, little bit of everything. Whatever needs to happen to keep the app running, basically. Nice. So my understanding is that you don't actually live and work in Melbourne. Hell no. Hell, hell no. <laughs> Get out. No. Um, uh, so whereabouts do you live? Uh, I come from a planet far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah, Newcastle in New South Wales. So, uh, nice. So you don't frequent in body... Coco heads a lot? No. No, but you're very active in the Slack and you watch live streams? I make a lot of noise. You make a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I do tend to watch the live streams as well when I can. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, primarily Mac work at Itty Bitty Apps. You love Melbourne. You wish you lived here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't believe those are the words that come out. <laughs> the, I'm pretty sure we could check the live stream. That is what you said. Um, so, did you grow up, grow up in Newcastle? No, I grew up on the um, uh, south coast of New South Wales in a little town called Kiama, so like a little beach village. Oh. It's a bit of a tourist hotspot now, but when I was growing up, it was like a really small, um, yeah, just like a surfing community, I guess. Okay. So, awesome. nice and quiet. And, and how did you get into tech? How did you get from growing up in this tiny little okay. town to where you are now? I was lucky enough. My dad at the time was a uh, high school teacher, so... Every holidays, he was allowed to bring the computers that they had at school, one of them home, for us to, to use for the holidays. So he would bring home, uh, I think at the start it was like an Apple Apple One or an Apple Two, and uh, <clears throat> mainly used it for playing games, but had a bit of a fiddle around with old Turtle Basic and a little arrow go around the screen and that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I think I knew from really early on that that's what I wanted to do. So um, all throughout school, obviously here in Australia, we had a lot of Macs in the education system. And uh, I think just being exposed to that, um, there was a pivotal point, I think, in my early years in high school where we were just starting to get into multimedia presentations on CD and DVD. So I think Wollongong Uni just put out Lyco Luca and Riv uh, Mist had just come out from um, Cyan, what are they called, Cyan? Oh, I can't remember what they were called at the time. But um, it's like these amazing leaps forward in um, media production and computers used for, for gaming. And I guess not the traditional kind of Twitch gaming that we were all into, but a bit deeper. And I just knew at that point that that's what I wanted to do. So I kind of set out on that path. And um, I was incredibly lucky. I was all set to, when I finished high school, to go off to um, a uni up on the north coast of New South Wales to do, I think, educational multimedia was the, the course. And in the two weeks before I was meant to go and find somewhere to live up there, um, an internship came up at Wollongong Uni, a very, very close team to the one that had actually built that Lake, Lake Iluka, um DVD, or CD at the time. And it was, it was, at the time, it was my dream job. It was all, the only place I'd ever really wanted to work. And, and you know, they had all the cool gear, all the latest Macs and the most expensive gear, most expensive stuff and big screens. And I mean, you've got to remember at the time, like, colour monitors at home were not a, not a huge thing. So colour screen at work, it was amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, we got to play with all kinds of stuff. They had uh, B-boxes and Sun workstations and, you know, SGI Indigo stuff for the 3D rendering. And I got exposed to this whole range of stuff that, that some of it was programming but other bits of it were you know, things like 3D modelling and rendering for TV production and um, a lot of web design. I got really into the, the web stuff as part of that internship and um, kind of just progressed from there. So I went into web development from there and um, looked after systems admin for some various things uh, and I realised a few years into that that uh, I wasn't really enjoying the, uh, the visual aspects of it and uh, started to get more and more into the programming side of things. Um, kind of made a choice at one point that I was halfway through a visual communication bachelor's degree that actually, you know what, I really love UI, really love 
visuals, but I wanted to program and I wanted to be in the nuts and bolts and making these things work. So I kind of changed tack and I started ruining other people's open source projects on SourceForge. <laughs> <laughs> Getting stuck in and downloading their stuff and submitting patches and telling, having them tell me go away, you know, learn to program before you come back. So I just kind of, you know, really just threw myself into it and, and, and figured stuff out for myself. I was lucky to work with a group of people who, you know, were application developers working on I guess bigger scale enterprise level stuff and they were able to expose me to concepts like object diagramming and um, you know, I guess more, more formal programming than I was used to. And it kind of snowballed from there. So the open source stuff really turned into my introduction into contributing to things and there were a few really early projects. Um, I think most of them were around virtual desktops. So there was a product called Virtue Desktops that I took over when the author decided he didn't want to make it anymore. And that was really my first introduction to kind of managing a product and contributing to it and programming it and really getting serious about, you know, Mac programming especially. Um, and built some other little small tools at the time, things like, I don't know if you guys remember back on the original MacBooks that had spinny hard disks that had the sudden motion sensors in them. So I built a little utility where you could smack one side of the screen and it would flip the desktop in that direction and smack it into the side and flip back the other way and <laughs> completely useless, but God, God it was fun. Um, and kind of snowball from there. I, I think um, I released a commercial product 2006, 2007, I think around somewhere around there. And it went reasonably well and I got a really, I think a reasonably good reputation out of that uh, and just contributing to projects. So it kind of went on from there. I freelanced for a number of years um, after that point and doing iOS and macOS work. And um, eventually got pulled into uh, itty bitty apps. So. so that first exposure to a large-scale project or working with multiple individuals mm -hmm. was an open source project. Mm -hmm. And those individuals were remote and people that you couldn't face-to-face -face with. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I didn't know that. That's, um, that sounds so challenging, especially, like, I'm guessing we, like, you, there were obviously wasn't Slack, there wasn't, like, no. quick comms, it was... It would have been ICQ, um, MSN, I think, uh, back when iChat used to be good, that was great for talking to people. You could um, <laughs> drag and drop images in, and uh, at the time, you got to remember, like, you know, now we, we don't think twice about FaceTiming someone, but <laughs> back then, like, being able to chat instantly with someone via instant messenger was, yep. it was a game changer, yeah. Nice. So, yeah. <clears throat> so your first kind of, in like, your first company um, exposure to work on a large product was Itty Bitty Apps? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think I'd worked on a few contracts and freelance projects yep. on other things, but being a team member, being part of a team, yep. I think Itty Bitty Apps, yeah, the first big one. Nice. Good. And how long have you worked at Itty Bitty Apps for? 2014? Yeah, don't look at Sean. <laughs> he doesn't remember either. Um, 2014, I think, was when I, I started. Yep. So, yeah, been there a few years now. That's amazing. So, working remotely... Uh, you're not wearing pants? Most of the time. Most no, of the time. actually, you know what? You know, I, I'll be honest here. I've never not worn pants on a video chat. Everybody wants to ask that. Yep. I've done the exact opposite. Yep. I always wear tracksuit pants in winter. Nobody can tell what you're wearing underneath the desk, so you might as well be comfy. It's funny, Maddie, my wife, asks me every time I'm working from home, why are you dressing up? They can only see here up. Mm. I still dress up. I still shower. Mm. I still brush my teeth. I still put on my workish clothes, which is what you see now. Um, I'm obviously over, overly confident. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, what are some of the greatest benefits or challenges of working remotely? Okay, so working remotely is not easy. It sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. I get to work from home, turn my music up as loud as I want and, you know, wear whatever the hell I want. If I'm not talking to anybody for a day, I can, I can you know, I can work in my pyjamas. But realistically, you've got to be really structured in how you approach your day. Um, I was, I had it so good, and then I had kids, and it just got absolutely impossible. You have to be almost more regimented in how you structure your day, how you approach problems, how you deal with things, because the big benefit of being at home, obviously, is getting to spend, for me anyway, getting to spend time with my kids, seeing them grow up, being there when things go right or wrong and, and not, you know, not getting home after dinner at night, like it's, it's lovely, but it does mean that for me to still do the job that I'm paid to do, I've got to work a little bit harder to, to make those, you know, those, their hours meet, I guess. Um, so big challenges is just being focused, being uh, structured in how you approach problems. No, I personally find that so fascinating. The few times I've worked from home, my infant can't 
walk or talk, still massive distraction. And you've got three little ones? Yeah. Yeah. They surprisingly join me rarely on FaceTimes with work, but <laughs> I, think, I think the guys have met a few, met a couple of them a few times over video calls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we'll wrap up with the final question. Uh, productivity tool or life hack? This is going to sound incredibly cliched. Cliche. Life hack. Life hack. I'm going to borrow a line from a, a, a very old time lord friend of mine. Be kind. Have empathy for the people that you're dealing with in your job and you'll get things done twice as fast as you would if you didn't. So if you can understand the other side of the problem and understand where another person's sitting and how they feel about it and be kind to them when you're asking them for something or asking them to do something for you, you're going to get a much better response and it's going to go a lot quicker than if you just say, hey, I need this, get it to me. So that, that's my life hack anyway. Be nice to everyone. Nice. Awesome. Um, as someone who knows Tony quite well, um, he is extremely kind and in person. Just not on Twitter. Lovely guy. Just, just not on Twitter. <laughs> Ask him about Catalyst on Twitter. It's hilarious. No. Um, massive round of applause for Tony. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> no